Ready. Action. Gloria. Oh, I'm attorney Gloria Allred. I'm attorney Gloria Allred. I'm attorney Gloria Allred. I see myself as a strong advocate and a person who works to win justice for women. So sometimes avenging wrongs? Could be. I'm, I'm pretty tough. That was five years old, that uh, little CBS This Morning profile. So uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm now 75 years old. <laughs> so. <clears throat> And, you know, people say, God, 75, and you're still fighting for women's rights? Well, we have a saying in the women's movement that the women's movement is unique in that it's the only movement in which the participants become more radical as they get older. Don't you agree? <laughs> and, that, and that is because we're feminists, most of us, because of our life experience. I never had a course in college, never had a course in law school in women's rights. It's because of my own life experience that I'm a feminist. And I thank the men who came tonight as well as the women because it's important that men be feminists as well. And uh, I think that's a point that President Obama made by declaring himself a feminist as well. And uh, because a feminist is just a person who believes in legal, social, political and economic equality for women with men. So how many of you are feminists by that definition? Very cool. Well, thank you. Well, I, I've had, you know, the blessing to be, uh, you know, to be able to be part of a law firm that has been the leading uh, private women's rights law firm in the nation for the last 40 years. And uh, I've, we've had so many interesting cases over the years. I'm going to share just a few of them with you. Well, more than a few. And, uh, but in addition to that, I'm going to look forward to your questions afterwards. But before I begin, today, February 15th, is the birthday of Susan B. Anthony, who fought so hard to win the right to vote for women. She didn't live to see the realization of the addition of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution suffrage for women, but she and Elizabeth Cady Stanton fought most of their adult lives for that. So let's hear a happy birthday, Susan B. Anthony. Happy birthday, Susan B. Anthony, okay because we always want to remember our four mothers as well as our four fathers and not have them be invisible, although there are certain people in government who would like, I'm sure, to forget them. Actually, I was picketed uh, a few months before the election was over, maybe it was the last month, by a man who was leading the picket outside of my office who proudly uh, indicated on a show that he was against the right to vote for women. And this is just a few months ago. So this is, you know, where we are in some, some point. But, you know, we've had, I, I always say, no one has ever given us any rights. We've always had to fight to win those rights. So let's be clear. We still, in 2017, have to fight not only to win rights, like the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment to the United States Constitution, but in addition to preserve the rights that we have fought so hard to win. And we'll talk about Roe v. Wade and some other rights as we proceed. But, you know, I've had so many fascinating cases. One you saw up here, Friars Club, um, which was uh, a private club in Beverly Hills, no longer in Beverly Hills, but at the time that I decided I wanted to join it, it was there. Uh, in Beverly Hills and also in New York. And why this matters is private clubs are palaces of power that often guard their entrances. And in the 1980s, the Friars Club, which was a restricted organization, uh, only a men's club, did not allow women into that club. And that, of course, perpetuates inequality in society. And because often deals are made at private clubs um, and excluding them, excluding women from those clubs really deprives them, uh, deprives us of the ability to do business on the same basis as men are able to do it. And that inequality has adverse financial consequences for women. So I made this my own personal cause in 1987 uh, with the world-renowned Friars Club. 
uh, which uh, was, of course, the long uh, regard, greatest, uh, uh, lo long a haven for the greatest comedians and a lot of show business people. But of course, even though they love to make jokes, I didn't find their exclusionary policy very funny. <laughs> so one day, uh, I was there for lunch uh, as a guest of actually a judge that I knew. And uh, so I went up to uh, Milton Berle, who was the head of it. How many of you remember Milton Berle? OK, but, all right. And um, so I, I went up to Milton Berle. And uh, I asked to join. Before that, uh, you had to be sponsored. And uh, one man did not that I approached didn't want to sponsor me. He was afraid he would be considered a troublemaker. Uh, another one that uh, said he would sponsor me was Dick Sean. But before he could do it, the next day he was on stage doing his act. And he literally dropped dead on the stage. Uh, and that some people thought that was part of the act, but he wasn't. And uh, so then I approached Milton Berle, whom I did not know, and he asked me, well, why do you want to become a member of the Friars Club? Uh, and, and, and he said, I said, well, of course, because you have a great Cobb salad. Why, why else? <laughs> and he said, well, you, would, you know, you would really be the first woman member. I said, oh, really? And he said, I think you knew that, Gloria. I said, well, we both laughed. And uh, by the way, he, he at first did ask me, well, how about being an honorary member of the club? And I said, well, Milton, you know, that would be a dishonor to be a member of a club that discriminates against women. So thank you anyway. I would rather pay, you know, and, and have full rights and responsibilities. And um, so that's, so I went to Milton and he said, Gloria, not only am I going to make the motion for your admission myself, I'm going to second my own motion. <laughs> and he says, why, uh, you know, he said, you wonder why? He said, you think it's because you're a woman? Wrong is to lower the average age of the club because the average age of this club is dead. <laughs> So um, that, with that, I became the first woman member of the Friars Club. And then, of course, that opened it up to other women to join. Um, and of course, it was really important. And, but then I decided, you know what? I, 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 there were reciprocal privileges with the New York Friars Club. So when I was there to do the Phil Donahue show, I had some clients with me. I decided I wanted to have lunch there. And they said, oh, no, you can't have lunch, the New York people said. I said, why? They said, well, we don't have any women members. And besides, women are not, even guests, are not permitted there to have lunch until after 4 o'clock. No women can come into the club, even wives, even you know, secretaries, anybody. I said, well, 4 o'clock's a little bit late for me for lunch. I don't, that's not good. It's not going to work. So why don't you think about it, and then I'll come back to you. And they thought about it, and they met, and this was some big decision for them, and they decided they wouldn't open up to me as a woman, so of course I did what any, sure, any one of you would do. I went back, I tried to go in, they said no, and so then I filed a complaint with the New York City Commission on Human Rights. <laughs> and I became the first uh, woman to ever file against a private club for discrimination in New York. Um, at some point, uh, the, New York the United States Supreme Court uh, took up a, a private club case from New York, and they ruled that, in fact, uh, a private club could not discriminate uh, uh, under the New York City ordinance. So on a Monday, when the Supreme Court ruled, I called the Friars Club in New York from Los Angeles, and I said, hi, it's Gloria. Did you, re did you hear about the US Supreme Court decision today? Uh, that means that you cannot discriminate on account of gender. And they said, well, yes, we've heard about it. I said, so can I have lunch there now? And they said, well, no. I said, well, please have my table ready tomorrow at noon because I'm going to be flying red eye tonight. And I plan to come in for lunch tomorrow. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you. So I got in a plane. I flew all night. I arrived. Henny Youngman was stood outside. Anybody remember Henny Youngman? He was like the biggest guy in burlesque years ago. And he came out, he was a friar, and he did his shtick. Oh, you're wearing a red suit, you look like a blood clot. 
Ha, ha, ha. Okay. So I let him do his thing because if you're a friar, you know, you want to let comedians just go ahead and do their thing. And then afterwards, I pushed him aside just gently and I said, Mr. Youngman, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to stop progress for women. And there were people yelling about women's genital areas, my genital areas, out the window, you know, yelling at me, all kinds of things. Troublemaker, which I proudly am. And uh, yes, absolutely. And I thank you. I pushed him aside and I said, I'm going in. You're not going to stop progress for women. And I went in. I went up to the maitre d' and I said, as I indicated yesterday, I'm here for lunch. Is my table ready? And they said, yes, Ms. Allred, right this way. So with that, I became the first woman ever to have lunch at the Friars Club. And in settlement of my complaint, thank you, of discrimination, I required them, for me to settle it, to open up the club in New York to women, lunch, and everything else. And that's how we won admission to the Friars Club. That's it. So, and then of course I had the whole thing, I had to integrate the whole 1,000 male stag roast in LA, in Beverly Hills, no women, and of course I went in, and you know, other people like, oh my God, Johnny Carson, oh, you know, she's here. And you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and all kinds of jokes, but that'll be for another time. So, uh, in any event, uh, I, I tried to get other women to go in with me, but they said they were concerned they'd be called troublemakers. And of course, being called names, if that's going to stop you, then you will never have any progress for women's rights. As for me, if people call me names, I think that's great because that means they don't have any good argument against what I'm doing. So they've got to resort to name calling, like somebody who's presently in the White House, whose name, I, of course, I will not say. <laughs> but yes, but against whom I did win. And you can ask me later in the question and answer period what, ca what, what issue I won against uh, our so-called president four years ago. Um, but in any event, so that was the Friars Club. That's how we won ent entry. But we've had so many, you know, of course, then they didn't want me to be in the steam room and, you know, the health club. And they had to ponder that, oh, it's men only. They're going in there naked. Uh, we, you know, how about, I said, look, here are your options separate hours for women, integrate women, everybody puts their clothes on, or okay, if you want to keep your clothes off, I want to go in anyway. So I did, uh, they didn't want to do anything, so uh, finally they said, okay, well we're not putting our clothes on. Like that's a threat to me, like I've never seen what they've got before. <laughs> you know, come on. So anyway, uh, so I, I was in a little gay 90s outfit and I went into the steam room. I knocked on the door first, I gave them notice. And um, I had with me, uh, I started singing Peggy Lee's, is that all there is? Is that all there is? And then of course I whipped out my tape measure, which I brought with. And you know, it's just amazing how, how fast those towels were whipped around those butts and around the front. Anyway, so that's how I was able to integrate the steam room at the Friars Club. And uh, after that, women were able to use the health club and no problem. So, but you know, sometimes you have to like be tough and sometimes you just have to smile and make a joke and do whatever. I always, uh, as I said in the, in the profile, do whatever's legal and peaceful. These days I'm going to eliminate the word peaceful and just say legal. Okay. But we've had so many other cases we had over the years, you know, pregnancy discrimination case on behalf of Hunter Tylo, who was on Bold and the Beautiful and then was on Melrose Place. How many of you remember Melrose Place, which was a big television uh, show, Spelling Productions, Aaron Spelling? <coughs> She was hired from Bold and the Beautiful to be on Melrose Place, and then she got pregnant, and she told them, and they said that was a material change in her appearance, and she could no longer you know, play the sexy role on Melrose Place. Well, radical that I am, I have always thought you can be bold, you can be beautiful, and you can be pregnant all at the same time. And that should not be a reason to exclude a woman from a job on television or anywhere else because she got pregnant.
In fact, when women are pregnant, they're, prob they're more vulnerable economically than at any other time in their life, probably, except maybe when they get older. Uh, but they're very vulnerable, and you know, they really need their job, and they need the income from it. So in any case, we sued uh, Spelling Productions, of course. All the commentators got on television and said, she'll never win, she'll never get to a trial, it's going to get dismissed, you know, all the naysayers. <laughs> as though I care what they say because I know they're wrong. And sure enough, we went to trial. We had a trial. The defense attorney put up a big chart as though, uh, you know, to show how much she gained each month, which is really offensive. Um, and if you don't gain, you've you got a real problem uh, if you're pregnant. But in any event, then there was a point during the trial where we asked Hunter well, you know, this couple years ago when, the, when you were fired from the job, um, you were pregnant, right? And of course, everybody was commenting how beautiful she looked now and how fit. And then we asked, are you pregnant now? And there was like a big intake of oxygen in the room. People went, <gasps> and sure enough, she was pregnant. She was like, I don't know, six, seven months pregnant and nobody knew. And in any event, we won that case. We won a multi-million dollar verdict for Hunter. And Hunter, I want to give all the credit to, because after all, she had the courage. So many women in the entertainment industry are afraid of being blackballed. They're afraid of what will happen if they sue their employer. They're afraid they'll never work again. She took a deep breath and did it. And as a result, she was able not only to change the policy there, uh, but many other producers all over Hollywood started thinking, wait a minute, maybe, maybe we, can't, we can't fire actresses just because they get pregnant. So round of applause for Hunter Tylo. She's a real hero. Okay, we've done so many other cases. One of them, uh, you know, of course, we sued Saks Fifth Avenue for charging women more for alterations than they charged men. And, you know, it's bad enough that women earn less than men, and now they have to pay more to get alterations than same alterations that men could get for free. Of course, we were successful in changing the policy of Saks Fifth Avenue nationwide. We've sued dry cleaners uh, for charging more to dry clean a woman's shirt than to dry clean a man's shirt, and we were successful in getting them to change that policy. We sued the yellow balloon years ago for charging more for little girls' haircuts than little boys' haircuts. I mean, really, if it's the same experience and the same, you know, if it doesn't take any more time and so forth, why should little girls be charged more than little boys? And we were successful in changing that policy. Uh, we sued uh, re the, the Catholic Church back in the 80s. We were one of the, I think, probably the first case that anybody ever heard of suing the Catholic Archdiocese because we alleged Rita Mia had been sexually abused by seven Catholic priests and had a baby by one of them. And of course, everybody said, what? And um, at the LA Times sent a group of reporters to the Philippines to check if what we're saying is true because a lot of these priests were from the Philippines but they were in Los Angeles, which is where the abuse of Rita took place. And uh, they found that everything we said was true and then some. So we fought that case for 23 years and we finally won. And that also, I think, opened up and gave courage and empowerment to so many other people, boys, men who were sexually abused, women who were sexually abused by their priests. And she was a, a, a young Catholic woman whose parents were Catholic and who trusted her in the church. So they were all devastated by this. And um, so, but it, it, it has this ripple effect of people becoming empowered when they see what is possible. So Rita hung in there and please, even though she's not here tonight, give a round of applause to Rita Mia. Thank you. Oh, by the way, after we filed the case, they all went into hiding. But being the relentless son of a gun I am, we found them. Uh, we found many of them, and we included, and we, including the one that we believed was the father of the baby. And uh, she got pregnant, had a baby. Um, and the story's in my book. But... Um, and we tracked him down, and we got an order from the court that he was ordered to take a paternity test. 
And guess what? He was the father, and I call him the father father because this baby was actually conceived in the church rectory. So yeah, he. Uh, so at least we established the paternity, and and the child now at least knows who her father is. But we've also fought Holocaust deniers. Uh, we won a big uh, lawsuit uh, on behalf of a um, Mel Mermelstein who was. His arm, when we met him, he still had the tattoo on it, uh, A4685, which was put there by the Nazis during World War II. He was a Jewish survivor of the Nazi death camps at Auschwitz, Birkenau, and Buchenwald. And the rest of the family hadn't been as fortunate. But his father, his father worked himself to death as a slave laborer for the Nazis. And his brother was shot and killed by them during a death march between concentration camps. And, and then in 1944, Mel watched as his sobbing mother and sisters were led to their death in Auschwitz's gas chamber number five, and he saw the smoke curl out of the chimney after their murders. So anyway, after enduring that hellish experience, Mel was shocked 35 years later when he received a letter offering him $50,000 if he could prove that, quote, Jews were gassed in gas chambers at Auschwitz. And the letter came from some, a group called the Institute for Historical Review, um, IHR, which is an organization that contends that the Holocaust was a hoax. And uh, the letter further threatened Mel if he didn't accept the offer, quote, very soon, end quote. The Institute would, quote, publicize this fact to the mass media, end quote. Well, in any event, what happened is uh, Mel uh, did uh, accept the offer because he knew what he saw with his own eyes, and uh, they refused to pay. Um, and um, that story is in my book as well. But they refused to pay, and you know, my partners happen to be children of survivors of the Holocaust. Um, being that I'm Jewish as well, and you don't have to be Jewish to care about the Holocaust. And yes, I'll say the word Holocaust unlike our so-called president. Having said that, I couldn't help myself. I can't help it on, on that day. <laughs> Holocaust Memorial Day, he couldn't even say it? Please. Uh, in any way, to stop the lies and the distortion of history, the Jews really weren't gas at Auschwitz, murdered, I prefer. Um, and all of these little pictures of children having ice cream in the death camps, which I saw with my own eyes, the pictures, which really are revolting. Um, Mel decided to sue because he wanted to vindicate the memory of his family and the families of six million Jews murdered by the Nazis. Um, anyway, we, uh, we did sue, and I'm happy to say an all-Christian jury awarded him the verdict, and we won that case. And so give a round of applause for Mel Mermelstein. But in addition, they had to issue a formal apology, which they did, um, and a formal apology to Mr. Mel Mermelstein and all other survivors of Auschwitz for the pain, anguish, and suffering he and all other Auschwitz survivors have sustained relating to the re reward offer, which was anyone who could prove that the Holocaust really happened. So uh, there's more, but all I can tell you is this, these are the kinds of battles we still have to fight. Okay, we can't take anything for granted. We've also had to fight on behalf of individuals who are gay and lesbian and individuals who have AIDS. So many years ago, um, you know, in the 80s, uh, I w well, yeah, early 80s, 1983, I had wonderful clients, uh, two women who were business women who went in to have a dinner to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday at a fine dining restaurant called Papa Chu. And um, they had six booths for romantic dining. You went up a few steps and then the curtains and violinists strolled by and you could close the curtains. Um, anyway, they, were they made a reservation, they sat in the booth and then they were told, uh, oh sorry, <laughs> it's been a mistake, you have to move. We have a house policy. Two people of same sex can't sit in these booths. You can sit anywhere else in the restaurant, but you can't sit in these booths. And they said, well, that's ridiculous. We want to see the owner. So then the owner or somebody high up in management came by and they said, well, you know, 
it's not just a house policy. There's a city ordinance. Two people of the same sex cannot sit in this booth for romantic dining. And so you'll have to move. And they said, well, one, was, one woman was Latina, the other one was African American. And they've said publicly since, well, we, we said to ourselves, what should we do? What would Martin Luther King Jr. want us to do? Would he want us to sit in the back of the bus, the main section, or would he want us to go to Glory Allred? <laughs> <laughs> so guess what? They came in. And we thought, we talked about it in our firm. Well, let's see. I mean, is this a case? Does this matter? I mean, is this ridiculous? You can't sit in the booth, but you can sit somewhere else. And we decided, you know, if you think that Rosa Parks, what she went through was just about a bus ride, she could sit in the back of the bus, she'd still get there. Well, I guess you think this doesn't matter. But if you think it matters that people should be afforded respect and dignity and equal rights, then it does matter. And we should do something about it. So we sued the restaurant. And the judge made a little you know, visit to the restaurant. He wanted to see what I called the corpus booth eye, the, the booth. OK, not that that makes any difference as a matter of law, but he was interested. So we went, and then he ruled against us. And then we went up on appeal, and we won. And that was one of the first decisions that, that indicated that the Unruh Civil Rights Act in our state does not, perhip, does not permit discrimination on account of sexual orientation and or gender. And so we won that case. And since then, we've been able to cite our own legal precedent in other cases for individuals who are gay and lesbian. So we're really proud of Roland and Kowitzki, of our clients. And of course, we had the AIDS case as well, Paul Jasperson who was not allowed to get a pedicure after he disclosed he was HIV positive in Jessica's nail salon. Uh, again, if you think that's just about a pedicure, well, maybe you think Rosa Parks was just about a bus ride. But this was about exclusion from a business service in West Hollywood solely because they learned he was HIV positive. We fought that for 16 years. We wanted to uphold the West Hollywood City Ordinance that prohibited discrimination on account of the fact that a person has AIDS or is perceived to have AIDS or perceived to be HIV positive. And they fought against it really hard. Uh, and I'm happy to say we won two legal precedents. We've even, we, persi we persisted even after Paul, may he rest in peace, passed away. I promised him that we will fight to the end. And we did win. And we're so proud of Paul Jasperson. So give him a round of applause. OK, Bill Cosby case. Bill Cosby. OK, well, it started out, uh, you know, women speaking out. Andrea Constant filed a civil lawsuit. She settled it, uh, confidentiality clause. But then suddenly, Hannibal Barris, a comic, a couple of years ago, was doing his comedy act. And he said something about, oh, Bill Cosby is a rapist. Somehow somebody picked that up on a cell phone video. It went viral. And women started coming out and saying, you know, he sexually assaulted me. And then women started calling me. And I thought, well, oh my gosh, well, what can I do? I can't do anything because it's too late. The statute of limitations, which is an arbitrary time period set by law, it's, it's too late for them to have a case criminally prosecuted even if a prosecutor thought he or she could prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, it's too late for them to file a civil lawsuit seeking damages. What can I do? There's nothing I can do. But the women wanted to have a voice. They didn't want to be silenced. So I started helping them to speak out. Now there's a criminal case against Mr. Cosby. I also am litigating a civil lawsuit against him on behalf of Judy Huff, who alleges she was 15 years old when she became victim of sexually inappropriate conduct by Mr. Cosby at the Playboy Mansion. And this was a recent interview, let's play this, about that case. 
At least 58 women have come forward with accusations that comedian Bill Cosby raped or sexually harassed him over a period spanning five decades. So far, the only criminal case against Cosby that's moved forward involves Andrea Constant, a former employee of the Temple University basketball team who claims Cosby drugged and sexually assaulted her in his home in 2004. So here to discuss whether more criminal charges may be on the way for Cosby is attorney Gloria Allred, who represents dozens of Cosby's alleged victims. Victims. Gloria, if the claims are true, how has Cosby been able to keep this predatory behavior for so long? How has he successfully done that, which he absolutely has? Uh, hi, Mike, and thanks for inviting me. Also, I want to add that, yes, that is the only criminal case that is pending against Mr. Cosby. However, there are also an, uh, several civil lawsuits filed against him. For example, I uh, am litigating a case on behalf of Judy Huth, who alleges that in her lawsuit that Mr. Cosby uh, uh, sexually assaulted her, committed an act of sexual misconduct against her when she was only 15 years old at the Playboy Mansion. That's an allegation of child sexual abuse, uh, and we are litigating that. Having said that, to answer your question directly, uh, many of the accusers did not file a police report with law enforcement, did not proceed to assert their uh, allegations or claims against Mr. Cosby in any civil lawsuit. Uh, and for many of them, and I do represent many of them, but not all, uh, they believed that, in fact, no one would believe them or they were in fear of making any uh, allegations against Mr. Cosby uh, because he was rich and powerful and famous and uh, well-respected type of father figure, uh, which is what he portrayed in his television persona. And they feared uh, that they would suffer repercussions or retaliation by either Mr. Cosby or his supporters if they made such claims against this celebrity. Uh, so uh, that is, in fact, what they uh, allege is the reason that they did not come forward uh, earlier, or they may also have felt that somehow they were responsible, blamed themselves, as often victims do, even though they were not, in fact, responsible for what happened. How would you describe, Gloria, over the years, you've had such a huge impact on uh, women's rights cases similar to this, just, just like this in many regards. But in this case, you actually, I think some of your work actually changed the law in California where they changed the statute of limitations. They were able to make some positive changes to where women could bring these cases because so, so many times statute of limitations on rape cases, uh, they, 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 it's impossible for the victim to really come forward because they're excluded, the case is excluded. Your work has been successful in changing a lot of that. What, what is your, what's your take on that issue in general, the use of statute of limitations on rape cases? The statute of limitations in the United States is for uh, allegations of sexual assault or rape is different in every state and is different for criminal versus civil and is different if it's an allegation that an adult was sexually abused or that a child was sexually abused. So to, you know, to, to, to make it very, very simple, what we've done is we have gone to various states ever since this Bill Cosby uh, situation developed. And many of the accusers say that it's too late now for them to do anything, and therefore they can't do anything of a legal nature, although, of course, there's no statute of limitations in speaking out against what is perceived to be injustice. So we've gone to Colorado. We have gone to Nevada. And there we were successful with the uh, huge assistance of uh, some of the accusers, and we have been able to change the law to lengthen the statute of limitations, the time period, for criminal prosecution of rape and sexual assault. And after that, we went to California. We testified in the legislature. I met with uh, some of the governor's representatives. And, uh, you know, many of the accusers, some of whom I represent, also testified and uh, spoke out. 
And because of their courage, uh, we were able to go for what I call the whole enchilada. The, uh, t we yeah. didn't want to extend it in California for criminal prosecution. We wanted to eliminate it. And we have been successful, and I give a great deal of credit to the accusers and also to our governor, Governor Jerry Brown, who ha had uh, the vision and the foresight and understood how important it is to eliminate that statute of limitations in the future for criminal prosecution yeah. of rape and sexual well, assault. He signed the bill into law. Well, I got to tell you, in a David and Goliath combat scene, I'm going with you every time. Gloria Allred. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Good luck out there. You, you, you've made a, such a huge difference in your career already, and this is an important case. Thanks for joining me. Well, thank you. We're 40 years for women's rights. We've been fighting for them, and we're going to continue for as long as God gives me this gift of life. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I like to make lemonade out of a lemon, and so the lemonade, the lemon we have was women having the courthouse door slammed in their face because of the statute of limitations. But now some of these women who couldn't do anything except speak out have found that they can do something. They can go to the legislature. They can help to win changes in law, which we were successful in doing in California, so that at least it will help others similarly situated in the future. So I'm very proud that they have become empowered and they've become, I'd say, from first survivors then victims, and then fighters for change. And so that's, that's a great tribute to them. Okay, so um, now, I, Mr. Trump, uh, I know you're not interested in him, right? Did anybody want me to say anything about our so-called president? Raise your hand. Okay, all right. Okay, so, all right, well, I first met, well, I didn't first meet, actually, I've met Mr. Trump over the years, social occasions here and there. But then I had an issue with him about four and a half years ago when uh, over the Miss Universe, Miss Canada pageant, uh, because there was a beautiful woman in there, Jenna Talakova, who had always wanted to be in the pageant. She was just gorgeous. And somebody anonymously called the pageant and told them that she had been born with a penis. Now, those of you who actually have one now, um, <laughs> it's not a crime, so don't worry about it. Uh, but in any of, it is a crime, I guess, to have a uterus and then get an abortion. In some places they want to make that a crime, but moving on. Uh, anyway, they kicked her out. Mr. Trump owned the pageant, and the pageant kicked Jenna out in Canada. Well, of course, she was devastated. She contacted me from Canada. She flew down to L.A., we had a massive standing room only press conference where I demanded of Mr. Trump, you got to put her back in the pageant and you have to eliminate the pageant's rule that you have to be a naturally born female, naturally born woman. And I said something to the effect, you know, Mr. Trump, we really don't care what your anatomy looked like under your diaper when you were born and you really shouldn't care what under, was under her diaper when she was born. Well, that apparently got Mr. Trump pretty upset. <laughs> and so the next day, suddenly, he appears on TMZ and says something, and you can still Google this and see it on the internet. He says something to Harvey Levin like, oh, Gloria would probably love to see what's under my pants. So, of course, you know, I have to respond to that, right? <laughs> so I responded, Mr. Trump, I don't have a magnifying glass strong enough to see something that small. Well, then Barbara Walters got involved, then we flew to New York, and then it was on, right? Game on. And, uh, you know, Barbara went and interviewed him, and then she came back and interviewed me, and then she puts the microphone in my, you know, to me, and Gloria, I just came from Donald, interviewing Donald, and he says, he just realized your client's name is Jenna Talakova. And she holds up a white piece of paper. And she says, and this is what he says. And it says, G-E-N, it says genital. What do you have to say about that? Of course, why would I even think that, right? But I said, you know, Mr. Trump has to understand 
The world does not revolve around his penis or anybody else's penis. <laughs> if it ever did, those days are over. This is about exclusion from a business opportunity. Being in a pageant is a business opportunity. And it's about discrimination on account of the fact that Jenna is, is transgender. And this has to end. We're not going to accept this. And guess what? He put her back in the pageant. He eliminated the rule. And of course, he said, I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> so give a round of applause to Jenna Talakover. <laughs> but, you know, life comes around. And during the campaign, Mr. Trump was heard on television, well, Access Hollywood tapes, how many of you heard them? Okay. Saying that, you know, which Mr. Trump apparently indicating that he thought he had the right to grab a woman by her genitals uh, because he is a star, is what he indicated. And then there was the presidential debate afterwards where he denied doing what he was heard to say that he did do. And then after that, women started calling me from all over the country, telling me, you know, making an allegation that, in fact, he had done to them what he denied doing. So we start speaking out. Yes, I was an elected Hillary delegate to the Democratic National Convention, but that's not why I did it. I did it because women should have a voice to speak their truth. So Summer Zervos was one of them. And there are some others, and I'm just going to show you them because we went and we marched in Washington, and then I'm going to show you um, a little bit about Summer and what Summer said. But this was right before we began our march in Washington. By the way, before we do that, raise your hand if you marched at all in LA or at Malibu or wherever, Washington. Great. I'm proud of all of you who did. And those, next time, those who didn't, I want you there. Okay, let's, let's do this one. I'm attorney Gloria Allred, and today I'm here in Washington, D.C. for the Women's March on Washington. I'm honored to be able to be here with accusers of President Trump, who were courageous enough during the presidential campaign to speak out about what they said was their truth about Mr. Trump. Summer Zervos and Temple Taggart were two of the accusers, and they are here with me today. Summer is the plaintiff in a defamation lawsuit against President Trump. We filed that lawsuit this week in New York. During the campaign, Mr. Trump threatened the accusers that he would sue them after the election. I do not believe that any woman who alleges that she was sexually assaulted should ever be bullied, and there should never be a threat which can be interpreted as a message to silence a woman who alleges inappropriate sexual contact. Women will not be silent. They will be courageous. They will be empowered. And we believe that they will be inspired by the courage of Summer and Temple and the other accusers who are at this table. <coughs> this is not the time for voices to be silenced. It is the time for voices to be heard. Now more than ever, it is time to be brave and time to speak truth to power. It is also the time for all of us to support brave women and men who dare to speak out and stand up to fight back. We will not be deterred and we will not be silenced. As the United States Supreme Court stated, no person is above the law even the President of the United States. All that we want is justice for women and their rights. As Susan B. Anthony, who fought for the right for women to vote, once said, failure is impossible. We look forward to joining hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children today on this march. We are an empowered movement, and we will prevail. And let's now hear a little bit from Summer. We filed her lawsuit in January, so that's just last month, 
against Mr. Trump for de alleging defamation, that when he called her a liar, called the accusers liars, said what they said was fa were fabrications and fiction, and, uh, and a little bit more about Summer. So she is the only one so far of all of the accusers to file a lawsuit against Mr. Trump, against President Trump, and let me just say, his answer is due on April 3rd. I'm sure you're gonna be interested in that. And at some point, I'm looking forward to taking President Trump's deposition. Do you, do you like that idea? And we'll talk about where that could potentially lead in just a moment, but let's hear from Summer. On November 11th, 2016, I called on Mr. Trump to retract his statements about me, calling me a liar. I also called upon him to state that what I said about his behavior towards me was true. More than two months have gone by, and he has not issued that retraction. I wanted to give Mr. Trump the opportunity to retract his false statements about me and the other women who came forward. Since Mr. Trump has not issued a retraction, as I requested, he has therefore left me with no alternative other than to sue him in order to vindicate my reputation. I want Mr. Trump to know that I will still be willing to dismiss my case against him immediately for no monetary compensation if he would simply retract his false and defamatory statements about me and acknowledge that I told the truth about him. Enough is enough. Truth matters. Women matter. Those who allege that they were victims of sexual misconduct or sexual assault by Mr. Trump matter. Prior to filing this lawsuit today, Ms. Zervos volunteered to take a polygraph examination regarding her allegations of Mr. Trump's sexually inappropriate conduct towards her. The lie detector test was administered by a very experienced and recognized polygrapher. She passed the lie detector test. I have not attempted to contact them. They're certainly aware of it. They know where I am. So the answer is she's done her best. Had he issued the retraction that I called for, we would not be here today. We've given him two months. Time is up. Although he could still do it, even though we filed the lawsuit. Why now? My answer would be why not now? All right, so where we are now is um, he's, they've accepted service, his attorneys have accepted service for him. His answer's due on April 3rd. And at that point, we'll see what he has to say. Um, it will not be a surprise to me if there is an attempt at some point to dismiss our case, to delay the case, to move the case, to do whatever. But as you know by now, I'm very persistent. And, um, I also have an office in New York. We have won a case at the highest court in New York. In any other state, it's called the Supreme Court. In New York, it's called the New York Court of Appeals on what defamation is on behalf of two adult survivors of child sexual abuse who allege they were defamed. So we do know about defamation law, and we're going to be very persistent. Now, of course, if as and when we're able to take the president's deposition, which is his testimony under oath, which we can do in a civil lawsuit, of course, uh, we will expect him to tell the truth. And I wouldn't suggest that he would lie, but if, you know, that's what he chooses to do, and I always expect everybody to testify truthfully under oath, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them God, well, then, if he failed to tell the truth about a material fact, that could be perjury. And, well, I have no doubt the Republican Congress would be interested in that, even though it's a Republican president. After all, they were interested when President Clinton did not tell the truth under oath, and they went on to impeach him, although they did not convict him.
So of course they'll apply the same standard <laughs> to a Republican president, because of course they'd want to be consistent. Party loyalty would not be foremost in their minds. But in any event, we'll see where this leads. In the Paula Jones versus President Clinton case, as I said, the US Supreme Court said that no man is above the law, and that includes the President of the United States. So there is immunity for official conduct, but not for private misconduct. This is private conduct that we're talking about that is being alleged. Defamation is certainly not official conduct if it can be proven. All right, so I, I, I do want to talk when we get to questions and answers about the threats to reproductive health and, you know, and our reproductive life, about the U.S. Supreme Court choice, about anything else you would like to, to talk about. But I will say this, um, you know, it's interesting that we are here at this stage in 2017. One would think that we wouldn't be here, that we would actually be at a point so much farther ahead than we are right now, but we are where we are. And, you know, it's just a sign to our daughters and to everyone else that we have to continue the fight. And I, I say that throughout my entire career, people in corporate America, my adversaries, and even other lawyers have tried to intimidate me. It has not always been easy, but I have learned that if you have a firm and burning commitment to right the wrong and you're prepared for the battle, then you can overcome intimidation. Because remember, if you are generating a strong reaction, you're probably saying something important. I've won many battles in my career by applying certain basic concepts and principles to my life. I start every day with the knowledge that helping people and fighting for justice is my duty and that nothing worthwhile comes without sacrifice, self-discipline, and courage. I am a lawyer, but you don't have to be one to win change. At Rosa Parks' funeral on November 2, 2005, then United States Senator Barack Obama reminded us that Ms. Parks had, quote, held no public office. She wasn't a wealthy woman. She didn't appear in the society pages. And yet, when the history of this country is written, it is this small, quiet woman whose name will be remembered long after the names of senators and presidents have been forgotten, end quote. And that's because she was, as Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm called her, quote, an heroic warrior for equality, end quote. So I say you too can be an heroic warrior for equality, even if you're not rich or famous. You too can make a choice to make a difference. Not, then United States Senator Hillary Clinton reminded us that we too can have a, quote, Rosa Parks moment, end quote. Well, I would urge you to have a Rosa Parks moment every day. Challenge yourself and challenge others to stand up for what is right. More than anything in the face of adversity and injustice, I want you to overcome your fear and be fearless. Find your voice and not be voiceless. Exert your power and not be powerless. I want you to be able to fight back and win justice for yourself, your children, your family, and your community. And when you're feeling pessimistic, or even hopeless, remember the words of Susan B. Anthony, quote, failure is impossible, end quote. There is no defeat in standing up for what is right and fighting injustice. As suffragist Carrie Chapman Catt said, quote, whenever a just cause reaches its flood tide, whatever stands in the way must fall before its overwhelming power, end quote. So I say speak up, fight back, and seek positive change. Others will follow your lead, and ultimately, you'll come out a winner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Laura, would you like to help me with the Q&A? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. So now we get the chance to ask uh, Ms. Allred some questions. I don't think there's probably any, though, Bring in the it room. On, what anything. do you think? Um, we have a couple of microphones. Do we have... You have one over there, too? 
Okay, so we have two microphones, so I'll, I'll start right here. And um, please remember to, this is about asking a question. Um, doesn't seem like anything's off limits, Nothing's though. Nothing's off limits. And uh, so we'll take a few minutes to do this. Thank you. Hi, God bless you. Gloria. Well, thank you. God Hi. bless you, and I'm sure she will. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, um, my name is David Gabriel. I'm an actor now for 50 years since live black and white TV. Now listen to me carefully today because I am a new breed. You may not uh, hear this, uh, uh, but I am a new breed. I'm not a SLGBTPI as the media tries to label people. I'm a semi-retired feminist, activist, fluid, licensed clergyman therapist from Philadelphia. Cool. Go Phillies. And from St. Peter's in New York, New Jersey. Since childhood, I noticed that I have the gift of having a woman's mind and brain. Is that a question? Uh, okay. Well, there's a little bit, maybe another 30 seconds. Okay. So I have a woman's mind and brain. So uh, my chaste sex drive was illuminated by men. I did quit the priesthood to legally marry an ordained Judeo Catholic Christian minister woman who passed away. So now I've been celibate for 30 years. Now in Malibu and Santa Monica, I'm recovering from a heart attack and attend another local place of Buddhist, Kabbalah, Judeo-Christian, multi-faith studies there in the church halls and dining rooms. But there I have been, quiet please. Okay, but you... Here's the question. I told you it would, how long it would take. So there I've been physically attacked oh. by a, a big scary man in his 60s. He, you see my bionic leg, yeah. but I go to church in a wheelchair because bionic legs hurt. So if I go to church in the wheelchair, it gives me a little bit of relief. So he has terrified me, pushed me and pulled me, saying that I had to leave. Uh, Sunday, he I lifted up my wheelchair, spinned it around so I, I would fall out, and then he called upon a, a man of color, and they pushed me down the road to land in the street. So my question is, is there anything that I can do about being man-to-man -man abused inside a place of worship. Yes, and what I would like to do, what's your first name, sir? Call me David Gabriel. David? Okay, David, if you don't mind, I would. what I would like to do is speak with you afterwards privately because I don't think it's appropriate to give legal advice in a public setting on a particular case, but I'm very happy to stay and speak with you afterwards and answer your question. Thank you so much for your courage and I'm sorry about the loss of your partner. And, um, and I'll look forward to speaking with you afterwards. Fair enough? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Your Gloria. Oh yes, um, I name, can't see where you are. It's right, right here in the back. Okay, go ahead. Um, my name is Nastasia Kramer. If you could comment, um, I haven't been really followed on that story that where you were involved with the Promontory Crest or association uh, regarding the 
uh, some legal matter was going on. I know you were going to that. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your question. I know Which you legal were, matter? Legal matter was an um, Stony Hill Association. I, I believe it started back sometimes in 2003 or four. I, I, I couldn't hear. Which association? Stony Hill, Pramantori. It doesn't sound familiar to me. You had some. But I have a dozen lawyers in my firm, so maybe there's somebody handling something else. But I, it doesn't sound familiar to me. It was in um, City Hall. Okay. Of downtown Los Angeles. Yeah, I apologize. I, I, I don't think, I don't think that was one of my cases. Oh, I see. But if you want to stay afterwards again I would and talk about it, I, I can see what we're talking about. I would like to. I'm Thank happy you. to talk with you further about that. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, yes. my, name, my name is Stan. Can you just give us your opinion of Roe v. Wade? We're yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. That is so that. important to me. Okay. <laughs> Roe v. Wade and, and how much we have to lose. Okay, 19, first of all, as you know, I'm a person who had an abortion when it was illegal for a doctor to provide one, although it was not illegal for a woman to have one. So, uh, and I almost died. So, and had to be taken to the hospital and packed in ice. So I'm, you know, we always say that was our women's Vietnam. More women were maimed or died from unsafe, illegal abortions before 1973 than men ever died in Vietnam and bless the hearts and souls and of those brave men in Vietnam. But we also need to recognize that this is what happened to women. And it was horrible. So in any event, and dangerous. Uh, but in any event, 1973, Roe v. Wade, U.S. Supreme Court decided that a woman does have a constitutional right to have an abortion at certain stages of her pregnancy. In other words, states like Texas that criminalized abortion could no longer criminalize abortion because women had a constitutional right to have an abortion. Well, in 73, a lot of us celebrated. We were just so happy. We were thrilled. And then, of course, we found out that the anti-choice forces were not going to go quietly into that dark night. Ever since 1973, up to and continuing to the present, every day there have been efforts by the anti-choice supporters, that's what I'll call them, I don't call them pro-life, um, and I don't, you know, to restrict, to eliminate, to make it more burdensome for a woman to have exercise her legal right to choose abortion. This has, been ta this has taken many forms. There's been terrorism against clinics. There's been bombing of clinics. There's been the shooting of the brave uh, Dr. Tiller where he's standing in the church foyer of his church on a Sunday waiting for his wife to sing in the choir and he was somebody who flew into states to perform abortions when no one else would or only one or two other doctors would and he was shot down he was assassinated in the church rectory and so there's been terrorism against clinics there have been, you know, attempts to stop women from going into clinics. I remember, you see in my book, pictures, you know, with a bullhorn outside of the clinics and having to take young women who were so frayed and pass them like footballs over into, to get them through the door of the clinic so they could have an abortion. Uh, but in any event, there's been efforts by legislatures in many states to um, restrict the abortion, to say, I think there's one right now I just read about today in some state where they're trying to require doctors to describe the fetus and the face and everything else of the fetus to a woman before she can decide to have an abortion. I mean, it's just really revolting what they're trying to do to deter women, young women, scare women. So the truth is in most, in many states throughout this country today, you can't, a woman can't get a legal and safe abortion. So young women, rural women, poor women are the ones most affected. Some of them don't have the bus fare to go to another state. Some of them don't have, they don't know where they can go. All right. So they're forced, it's, I call it mandatory motherhood, forced pregnancy. I personally don't believe that a fertilized egg should have more rights than an adult woman, but that's me. Okay, do you, do you agree? A fertilized egg 
should not have more rights than an adult woman. Now you say, Gloria, what? That's kind of extreme, isn't it? Not really. We have a person nominated for the U.S. Supreme Court right now by our so-called President Trump, and that's Neil Gorsuch, Ju uh, Judge, Ju Judge Gorsuch, who's deserving of respect. He's an appellate judge. But he's made decisions in a Hobby, Hobby Lobby case and in the Sisters of the Poor case where essentially Hobby Lobby didn't want to have to have Obamacare that required that women, these are the employees of Hobby Lobby, would be able to get free contraceptives in the insurance plan that Hobby Lobby had. And the judge upheld Hobby Lobby's point of view that because they were asserting their religious liberty, that they should not have to have an insurance plan which allowed women to be able to get contraceptives, free contraceptives, under the insurance plan. He's also written about assisted suicide. Well, I won't go into all of that. But let me just say that I have a deep concern based on President Trump's prior views. First, he said that women should be punished for having an abortion. Then he, back, he walked that back. Then he said he promised he would nominate for the Supreme Court the vacancy caused by Justice Scalia's death. A person who was, well, he would say pro-life, I would say, against a woman's right to choose legal, safe, and affordable, available abortion. Um, and I think he's fulfilled that promise with Judge Gorsuch, who will have a hearing, a confirmation hearing, in about five weeks. So we'll hear a lot about it. So given that I'm an action-oriented person, I would urge you, if you care about women not being compelled to be mothers if they choose that they need to have a legal and safe abortion for whatever reason they have, and why is it for me or anyone else? Why is it for someone in the halls of Congress to decide that they know better than a woman whether she should have an abortion or take a pregnancy to term? And particularly where so many of them are against contraception, why did they think that they should be able to decide for any one of you my daughter, my granddaughter, my granddaughter being in her 20s, uh, whether she can have an abortion or not, or whether she can have birth control. This is just absolutely outrageous and unacceptable. This is where we are, still fighting for this. So if you care, and I know many of you do, how many of you care about whether women should have access to contraceptives? And by the way, that's a big issue for men too. I mean, hopefully a lot of men think women should have access to contraceptives. And you know what? It does cost. And there are a lot of women who cannot afford the contraceptives if they can't get them through their insurance plan. We are very privileged to live in Malibu. We all know it. Whether we live on the beach, high up, somewhere, we're just, you know, working people, we're privileged. We're blessed. And a lot of people, they're not going to have that money. And their life is going to be changed. Because the most significant issue for a teenage girl young woman is, if she gets pregnant as a teenager and is forced to take that pregnancy to term, it changes her entire life. So this is, an, a, this is an administration that is out to hurt women and punish women. That's my opinion. Bolstered by the fact that President Trump went ahead and did re punishes, restricted women internationally even more than President Bush did, even more than President Reagan did. He imposed this global gag rule. It's called the Mexico, uh, you know, that rule. And, but he, he went farther. And this is going to hurt women all over the world. They can't even be told what their option is for an abortion. We're in a critical time.
okay, for women. And we're just not going to take it. We're going to stand up and we're going to be counted and we're going to be heard. Don't you agree? That's where we are. Oh, by the way, when President Trump said, oh, let's leave it to the states. Well, guess what? States were criminalizing it before 1973. There are still some states that have on their books statutes which will criminalize abortion if Roe v. Wade is overturned. So it's going to happen, folks, if it is. Maybe it won't happen with Judge Gorsuch. And maybe he'll respect what we call stare decisis, let the precedent stand, but maybe not. And then if there are more vacancies, and I was just at the Supreme Court because a good friend of mine invited me to a small dinner uh, with the Supreme Court justices, and I went this year and last year, and just was honored to be able to meet them. I mean, Justice Ginsburg, who's my personal shero. Yeah, right? We call her the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and don't we love her? Uh, the only woman's rights attorney on the Supreme Court, maybe the only one who ever will be on the Supreme Court. Anyway, she's 83, and you know, not in the best of health. But she's plugging along, and she's still clear in her head. But you know, there are a number of justices that are up there in age, and so if they retire or become ill, or God forbid die, then President Trump gets to nominate his nominations. And with the Republican Congress, they may rubber stamp them. And then they become justices of the Supreme Court. And then it can be an anti-choice Supreme Court. And those justices will be there for decades, long after our so-called president is no longer there, because they serve for life. And Justice uh, Gorsuch is only 49 years old. So he, you know, could serve for 40, 50 years and affect the law. Bottom line is it affects your life. It affects your daughter's life. It affects your son's life. Everything they do up there affects your life. Plus he's going to be able to nominate to the 100 federal judges or more to the lower courts these are seats that Obama, President Obama, had a right to fill, but the, president, but the Republicans blocked him from being able to fill them. And this one, of course, is what we call the stolen seat. Should have been Merrick Garland, Obama's choice. So I know that's a downer, but you know what? We need to know the reality. We have to know the truth so that we can take action and be heard and right and go to legislators' offices, and this whole group indivisible that is formed, you go, they're going to Republican offices as well as Democratic offices, and they're saying, here's what we need you to do. Stand up. Do your job. Do your job. And I think it's having some impact. Any other questions? We've got one over here. I have, I have two questions, one about if you had a crystal ball and you could predict whether any of the other women who had made accusations against Trump prior to the election would be joining the lawsuit. Well, they wouldn't be joining it, but they, I mean, or it's always a possibility that someone else will file. So do you, would you, if you were a betting woman, do you think that, how, how much money would you put on that? I'm not a betting woman, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't, I, I, but I, I will say this, we are very serious about litigating our lawsuit, which we're going, and I know that Mr. Trump knows that, because he knows I'm a serious person. Mm -hmm. In better times, he had some very good things to say about me. I doubt that they would be repeated today. But anyway, but you know, we're serious about this, and by the way, we're, anybody who wants to support the case, you can just go to my webpage, gloryallred.com, and there is, you can click on you know, a link to support Summer's case, um, but uh, which, which will be very important as we continue to litigate it. But I don't know whether anyone else will, but we are in a very interesting position. There are 75 other lawsuits, we understand, against Mr. Trump. Some filed before he was president. Maybe he's filed some. They filed against him, whatever. 
But this is the only one, I think, that, well, I think he's going to have to take this more seriously than any other case, let's just put it that way. That, that's just, that's my educated guess. Okay, thank you. He had some things to say about me before I filed the case. <laughs> and suddenly, there was no tweet once I filed it, which I consider a real compliment. We're I don't tweet, one more. except rarely. I'm not going to be tweeting about him. Uh, yes. You had a question? We, had a, we have a question over there. Okay. And tell me when we're out of time for questions. But okay. I'm, I'm willing to go, but I know. Okay, go ahead. Ms. Allred? Um, That's one of the nicer things I've been called lately. Who said that? Okay. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Yes, sir. Hi. Your neighbor. Oh, um, hi. <laughs> Can't see it over, over there. It's dark, but go ahead. Um, 45 seems to be stacking the um, departments of the government with people who have a different point of view from our previous president. And um, I'm just wondering if you have any advice for us about what we can do if it's not a lawsuit or uh, something that we can fight in court, but simply people ordering their departments to pursue policies that perhaps are um, not very progressive. Are you talking about in the, for, in the federal government? Uh, I am. I yeah. am. Well, that's hard. Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't even know if anybody knows what his policies are. I'm not sure if he knows or if his policy tonight is the same as it'll be in the morning. But it's just hard to say. It really is. But I just think generally we have to, you know, we have to stand up like people did in every state the day after the inauguration in many foreign countries. I saw a group, I think, in Antarctica. What was it, 40 degrees below or whatever, and they were out there protesting. Uh, you know, we have to make those sacrifices. We have to write. Yes, you can tweet, you can use social media, do whatever you can. Everybody can do something. We have to live our values. So we have to. And, um, you know, it, it, we have to do it in the streets, we have to do it in the courts, we have to do it in the legislatures, we have to do it in Congress, we have to do it anywhere and everywhere that we can. You know what? You all matter. I was on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial the day after um, the big march on Washington. You'll, you'll see this sometime in the future. But I was standing behind a Trump supporter and he turned around and saw me and I think almost had a heart attack. But anyway, I let him rant, along, rant for a while and then I said, may I respond? And he said, oh yes. I said, well what is your name? And he said, my name doesn't matter. I said, but sir, I disagree, your name does matter. You matter, we all matter. And then I thanked him, and I said, I also want to thank you for something. He said, you do? I said, yeah, I want to thank you for exercising your free speech. Because that's what we all have to do, even though we disagree. We all need to be heard, including all of these people here who were saying, this is what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. There are about 500 people on the step saying that. So each one of you matters, is my point. Each one of you can be heard. You don't have to be famous. It's what President Obama said when he was senator. You need to be heard. Do what Mother Jones, the famous labor organizer said. Don't agonize, organize. So that's what you need to do. And everybody can do something. And everybody can do something every day. And we all need to do it. Because if we don't do it, we know what the consequences will be. You can take, if you, go ahead. Uh, we had one more question over right, here. I'm just gonna, it, it was about uh, age discrimination in the workplace. Yeah, I've done so, that. So if you could comment about that, if there's any, anything new going on, anything that you, any advice that you would give. And well, that is a question. serious problem, age discrimination. We have a lot of cases of age discrimination in our law firm, you know, that we represent people on, and basically, if you're an, an employee and you're, age, and you're over the age of 40, you're in what we call a protected class. 
and you have certain rights not to be discriminated against on account of your age. And we know that there are a lot of corporations, there are a lot of companies who like to terminate people who are over the age, employees who are over the age of 40. Why? Because they're only thinking of their bottom line. And let's say they've got somebody 50 or 55, which is still young as far as I'm concerned, uh, or 60. They may be concerned about pension benefits, having to pay more. They may be concerned about having to pay more in salaries. They may be concerned about health issues. And, you know, that's a lot of that's based on stereotypes. Obviously, not everybody who gets older has a lot of health issues. Some people who are young have a lot of health issues. But I would say if you believe that you may be the victim of unlawful age discrimination, then what you should do is you should consult a private attorney about what your rights are. Do you have a strong case? Do you not have a strong case? You can do that in a confidential manner with a private attorney. You can also file a discrimination uh, complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. That doesn't cost anything. You don't have to have an attorney. But I'm saying you have rights. But what I would say, you don't necessarily have to file a lawsuit, is what I want to tell you. A lot of people don't know that these days, private plaintiff's attorneys like me, a lot of them, we do a lot of what we call alternative dispute resolution, confidential settlements. Nobody but the parties ever knows that there was a settlement. There's no lawsuit filed. There's no complaint filed with a federal or state agency can all be done confidentially, and it is. And most civil disputes are settled in that manner. We do that all the time. Nobody ever knows uh, except the parties and their attorneys, and there's a settlement agreement. So your future employer will not know. That's what happened. And you're also, when you do it for yourself, you're also making inroads for someone else because it teaches the corporation a lesson that, you know what, if they discriminate, the cost of the discrimination is not going to be borne by you, it's going to be borne by them. That's what I believe, the cost of the wrong must be borne by the wrongdoer, not by the victim. But I want to do it for yourself and think about it. And sometimes in confidential settlements you can also get a recommendation from that employer who settled with you give you a good recommendation for your next job. So just find out what your rights are and then you can decide you want to exercise them or you don't. Anything else? That's good. I wanted to thank uh, Gloria Allred again. Please join me in thanking her.